ओके सर वी आर लाइव नाउ हेलो गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू एन अदर सेशन फ्रॉम वॉइस इन टू दास्ट आई एम ऑनिर्बान घोष एज टू डेज होस्ट एंड टू डे वी आर एक्सट्रीमली हैप्पी टू हैव प्रोफेसर आनंद लाल विथ एस थैंक यू सर थैंक यू वंस अगेन फॉर एक्सेप्टिंग आर इन्विटेशन एंड वेलकम टू वॉइस इन टू दास्ट थैंक यू सो प्रोफेसर आनंद लाल first experienced the first hand magic of the stage in a few plays as a student of st javier school kolkata he learned the theater hands on on the kolkata group the red curtain which he joined after completing school in 1973 he was a graduate of presidency college and the university of calcutta to study world theater in depth he did a phd in theater from the university of illinois usa in 1986 returning to kolkata he got a lecturer's position at jadavpur university and retired in 2017 as a professor of english at jadavpur he taught drama and introduced practical theater course in which he directed student for public performance every year for 25 years his project is to establish in jadavpur university a tagore cultural complex with four separate theater spaces which own the prestigious ministry of culture funding from the government of india but but has still not materialized he began to writing on theater in 1978 in the kolkata newspaper the hindustan standard as theater critic of the telegraph and now the times of india he has reviewed more than 3000 productions his most important books include rabindranath tagore three plays the first english book exclusively on tagorean drama rasa the indian performing arts shakespeare on calcutta stage the oxford companion to indian theater twist in the folk tale three plays theater of india and indian drama in english the beginnings he has directed over 30 theater productions worked on many others especially such international successes as shakespeare's midsummer night's dream directed by tim sapel for which he did the dramaturgy and lectured widely abroad and at home on indian theater he wrote the teleplay of a nine episode serial on 200 years of bengali theater for durdarshan and translated into english plays by tagore and utpal dat so we are really 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 lucky to have professor anand lal with us today professor anand lal's today's lecture or talk will be based on his recent publication indian drama in english the beginnings so without any further introduction let's move to professor lal thank you once again and over to you Thank you, Anirban, and thank you, Voyages into the Past, for inviting me. Um, my former students in uh, JU know very well that I love uh, speaking to students. I love uh, interacting with them. You are the uh, the next generation who are going to change the face of India, so to say. I hope it does change uh, much um, more than um, uh, present circumstances are showing us. so uh, it's a pleasure to to talk to you and um, i am also happy to learn that uh, voyages into the past began at my old alma mater presidency because uh, i had the privilege of studying both my um, ba and ma degrees ma of course through presidency at calcutta university uh, so i was there at presidency for over 5 years and you might wonder why over 5 years in fact actually it was more like between 6 and 7 because those were the post nokshalite uh, years in which all the um, cu uh, exams had been uh, disrupted and therefore postponed so my ba uh, and this will remind you of present times it's not as bad as present times uh, maybe but uh, some others would think that uh, The, the earlier times were worse uh the uh, in terms of the uh, the time consumption because uh, my ba actually took 4 years to complete and my ma uh took uh, another 2 and a half years uh, so there was a kind of continuous uh, backlog of um, uh, exams that cu had to uh, administer at that time anyway so uh, just to to give you the uh, uh the good news that times can be bad at any time right uh, of course when you have a, a pandemic like this it's uh, 
it is a horrible situation to um, and totally unexpected to have to go through. Um, yes, this book that um, you have invited me to speak about uh, is uh, is a very interesting uh, book, um, even though I say so myself. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, new discoveries that I uh, chanced upon while uh, researching and uh, locating the, the main texts of uh, this book. Uh, I am, of course, primarily a theatre scholar. The, uh, the history of Kolkata theatre, Bangla theatre is my specific uh, area of interest. Of course, I have also translated, I have also uh, gone deeply into uh, Rabindranath Tagore, but um, uh, Kolkata Theatre is my central um, core research and teaching area, if I may put it that way. So even I, as a specialist in the area, was uh, quite surprised to learn uh, of the things that I did find out after so many years uh, while working on, on this book. Um, now, the the two, the first two things that uh, I want to tell you, because I am, I think, uh, uh, from what I do understand of voyages into the past, many of you are students of history. And uh, uh, the first couple of things that I would like to let you know is that while we are uh, looking at perhaps, I mean, just by looking at the title of the book, reading the title of the book, Indian Drama in English, you might be thinking that this has mainly to do with literature. Of course, it does. Uh, but uh, it is actually much more a hi historical excavation and unearthing of uh, plays that were not well known. And some had completely disappeared, actually not known at all. So it is literally an archaeological uh, excavation that I had to um, undergo, uh, undertake for, uh, for this particular book. One of the first things that I talk about in uh, literature classes that deal with research is the fact that you have to be conscious of uh, your own um, historical roots. I think all of you are very conscious of um, the lack of history in um, the present generation, in your generation, as well as society at large around us. And uh, it is almost as if uh, people have um, lost their memory of, uh, of events, major um, traumas that took place earlier on. Uh, yes, we know certain, we know of certain traumatic um, episodes in India's past, but very often the details are not known to us. And what constantly um, surprises me is that uh, we at the present time are going through so many crises um, which actually analogous events and crises have taken place in the past, both in Kolkata and in India and of course in the world. Uh, and so this knowledge of history is so very important for all of us. You, those of you who are students of history already know this, but I am reiterating it. And uh, I am also, in a certain sense, requesting you to make the knowledge of history more um, uh, aware, uh, more conscious knowledge that can filter into society at large so that we might even be able to um, connect with things that happened in the past. And we might even be aware that uh, become more perhaps even find solutions for uh, things that are happening to us today through what happened in the past. Uh, 
I mean, just by way of um, uh, parallelism, some of you are probably aware that uh, there was a major pandemic uh, just a little over 100 years ago uh, in India itself and the world, just like we have the present um, pandemic in um, uh, um, uh, across the globe, that was the Spanish flu. But how many people actually know about the, the history of the Spanish flu, the so-called Spanish flu, because it was actually not so much Spanish. Uh, in 1918, 1919, which, by the way, killed so many Indians. And again, historically, we don't know too much about this. So that itself tells us that there is so much to be learned from searching out documents, from going into the archives, uh, from uh, searching libraries for uh, material. One of my friends is actually doing just this, looking into the connections in terms of similarities between the uh, Spanish flu pandemic and today. And he has to, of course, locate his material in libraries and archives, very often, for instance, in newspaper libraries and archives, uh, which are very difficult to actually access uh, in India. Not so difficult abroad, but unfortunately, in our country, uh, old newspapers are so brittle, so fragile, many of them have not been uh, digitized. Uh, where they have been digitized, it's impossible to actually get into those archives. You require special permission. So there are all kinds of difficulties involved in doing such work in, uh, in India, as those of you who are doing dissertations are uh, perhaps aware. Uh, the other thing that is absolutely uh, crucial for you to understand is the net does not have everything. You know this. But let me tell you very uh, categorically that uh, most of the work, the primary sources that you ever have to work on in terms of any area of historical research would have to involve hard copy searches. They are not going to uh, be found on the net. And uh, in addition, the other problem about the net is that there is all kinds of misinformation, false information, disinformation uh, circulating on the net. So to sift through all that is itself a huge waste of time. So while we have it as a very valuable and essential resource today, at the same time, I encourage all of you to, like I did, sit in the National Library, sit in other libraries, find out where the actual material, the primary sources really are. So these are things that I tell, I used to tell my students uh, in class. The other thing that I used to often tell them to do is, you know what you can do to contribute to uh, um, research in a primary way? You must go back to your homes, your ancestral homes, and you must locate diaries, journals, letters, hard copy, manuscripts, many of them falling apart, which your great grandparents, your grandparents had written perhaps and tucked away. Unfortunately, many uh, Kolkata families, many families in India have lost these precious materials because they've just been thrown out. You know, you've uh, moved out of the old ancestral home You've gone on to a new home, and along with that churning, all the old documents have gone. Many, many, in fact, have got spoiled anyway. But still, there is material that deserves to be resurrected. Go into the Almiras, go into the cupboards where they are, bring them out, as indeed one of the plays in this book was brought out by a student of mine. And literally, after he heard me talking about these things in class, he came to me one day. I have recounted that incident in the book itself. He came to me saying, Sir, in my uh, uh, home, I have a couple of books that I would like to show you. So I said, of course, uh, by all means, I am always interested in, look at, in looking at uh, old books. These were actually not old books. Um, when he came 
to me the next day he brought back leather bound gold embossed with the insi insignia the emblem of his own family gold embossed on top and i opened them two of them and i opened them and i find find that these are the manuscripts of handwritten manuscripts of michael modushudan dat two works by him and this is kind of in my own career in my own life this was unprecedented you see in literature we are often trained to uh, work on literary texts uh, but we can't find too many literary texts primary texts to work on today uh, in in calcutta in india you can find them in archives in libraries in museums in collections in new york in london but not so much over here so this was something that uh, you know i immediately decided this has to come out this has to be published because nobody had seen it before well maybe they had seen it before but nobody had printed this before in full um uh, in its fullness that i had in front of me the manuscript itself was actually brittle it had been damaged by damp you know how kolkata's monsoon damp is it had become illegible therefore through the wet pages on a few pages the damp on a few pages but still it was my duty it was my responsibility to transcribe very difficult because this is mind you handwritten so you have to figure out how michael wrote what was his calligraphy like all of us our handwritings are quite unique aren't they so he had a particular way of writing the double s the l y so i had to figure those out hmm. and um, this is what went into for instance the uh, uh, the main play in this collection uh, of three plays which was on rizia so that was the initial um sort of push that once this came to me i simply had to bring it out the other two plays let me kind of now backtrack just to give you some idea of um, what um, i decided i had to actually embark on in terms of not just this play but the early history of 19th century indian drama in english uh, most people don't know even uh, knowledgeable professors uh people have who have written books on the subject uh generally seem to think that uh, indian drama in english began as late as the 1870s and uh, this is not true as my book proves um and uh, they generally point as a result of uh, a, a book that had been published about 50 years ago by one of the doyens Uh, of um, academic scholarship on indian literature in english k r srinivasa ayengar uh, now that uh, major work of his called indian writing in english points to a play in 1871 which is titled is this called civilization by michael modushudan dat now uh, K R Srinivasa Iyengar in his book and that has been that wrong information has been circulated su subsequently by so many other people it has been perpetuated second hand third hand fourth hand etc uh Srinivasa Iyengar assumes that this was um translated by Michael himself Now those of you who know a little bit about uh, uh Bangla literature will understand that uh, Michael Modushudan had a play a farce by the name of um Ekai ki bole shobhota hmm. and Ekai ki bole shobhota was translated into uh English as is this called civilization in 1871 but it was not translated by Michael Modushudan it was actually translated by a different person darokanath banerji and that translation i have not yet found so here is something for you researchers and historians to 
find for me, track down, and I will give you a prize. Right? I have been at it for more than 10 years. This play, 1871, is this called Civilization, translated by D. N. Banerjee. 42 pages. I've got all the details. 42 pages published at uh, the Light Press, which is on Ripon Street in Kolkata, hmm? disappeared, vanished from the face of the earth. 300 copies were printed, gone. OK, they must be somewhere. It's not in the National Library. As far as I know, it's not in the Bongyo Shaito Porishad. And it's not anywhere else that I have searched. But maybe you can find it. Maybe in some old family library in North Calcutta somewhere. Please do and come to me with it, right? My, I'm getting old. My search for the Holy Grail is being stumped, right? Because I haven't found this slim 42-page translation. Because I'm a translator, in 1871, somebody translates from Bangla a farce into English. That is early days for translation. That's why I want to know what, how was this translated? What did the translator do? Okay. So that was one of my uh, original Im, uh, impulses. You know, I, I needed to track it down. I haven't been able to track it down. But instead, I have tracked these three plays down. And none of these are translations. These were originally, all three plays, originally written in English. The first of them, and it coincidentally happens to be all of them are relatable, related to Kolkata. The first of them goes back to 1831. Now, 1831 is early days for drama in India. OK, so the the background of this particular play called The Persecuted, published in 1831, written by K. M. Banerjee, Krishna Mohan Banerjee, who subsequently becomes very famous, one of the VIPs of uh, Calcutta um, intelligentsia, the academic elite, the scholars, also himself, uh, he was later known as the Reverend K. M. Banerjee because he was a Christian priest. Uh, in 1831, he was only 18 years old, younger than most of you. And he wrote this play. And some of you actually know the history behind this play because this was a notorious incident in Calcutta's Orthodox society of that time. Uh, those of you who don't know about it, I'm just going to very quickly tell you the nutshell. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what it what it is about. It's about contemporary society. It is about K.M. Banerjee's own life at the age of 18, which is that um, he was one of the students of Hindu College. Hindu College, of course, Presidency University's uh, former first incarnation. Uh, he was a few years junior to Henry de Rosio. He was never taught by de Rosio, but he became uh, an ardent follower, disciple of uh, young Bengal under, as you know, uh, de Rosio was this uh, uh, luminary of young Bengal. And uh, a lot of the young Bengal students of Hindu college at that time, after class hours, used to meet in K.M. Banerjee's own home which, by the way, still stands, not owned by the Banerjee family. They sold it off later on. But the house is still there in Guru Prashad, Choudhury Lane, near Bidashagar College in uh, North Calcutta. You can look it up. Uh, you can go there and visit. In fact, they have a little Cha Adda place in front of it, uh, um, in the front room. The very same place where the young Bengal students, presumably, used to gather for Adda 200 years back. Now, when they used to gather in the evenings, just like you do, they used to talk about everything, discuss everything. They used to have cha and snacks and other things too, right? Like we all know, all young people gather. And also, apart from having fun, they discuss very serious issues, right? So that's the, the, the entire focus of the Arda. One fine evening, it gets out of hand. Um, the young Bengal students there, who, by the way, are the uh, vanguard of the uh, uh, liberals, the progressives, even, I will say, the radicals, the revolutionaries, 
because that was the romantic period with a capital R, the 1820s, all over Europe and therefore De Rosio as well, uh, over here, you know, teaching Byron, teaching his students that uh, rebellion, revolution, romanticism is, is how to, you know, become more modern, exactly was that was what the students followed. So one fine evening, they go and buy some quote unquote forbidden meat from a nearby meat shop. And they also buy some uh, drinks, alcoholic drinks, and they get a little inebriated. And one thing leads to another. Uh, some of them decide that they're going to throw this forbidden meat. Um, you all know what that will be and bones into the neighbor's house and not just that, shout out what the meat is. All hell broke loose. You can imagine the consequences. Uh, by the time, at this time, Krishna Mohan actually was already had started his teaching career. He was himself not present there. He was teaching at that time in Potoldanga school, which later on became Hare school. He comes back and he finds this crowd, almost a mob of the para surrounding his house. And uh, everybody is extremely angry, agitated, etc. And his uncle, who was the head of the household of his house at that time, his father having died, um, tells young KM Banerjee, you just have to leave. Just just go because, you know, this is impossible, an impossible situation. It is it might lead to a riot. It might lead to violence. Um, just go. And it became actually worse than that because his uncle basically told him, leave the house for good. Never come back because it has got out of hand. If my family has to reside in this house, I will have to live peacefully with my neighbors. And if these kinds of things continue, I will not be able to. Therefore, go. Obviously, the uncle must have been extremely angry. And, you know, I mean, I can understand. I may not necessarily sympathize with the orthodoxy. But at the same time, I can understand what he must have thought and felt. It was, after all, his house. So what happens is one thing leads to another. And then um, KM Banerjee goes leaves uh, in the darkness. He never steps back into his house again for the rest of his life. He is almost a fugitive. He goes with one of his friends, um, Dokkinaranjan Mukherjee, to his house. Um, people actually hound him even out of that house, his friend's house, so that he has to go elsewhere. And finally, he takes refuge. Um, according to one person's account, in the house of Alexander Duff, who was a, a major uh, missionary, Christian missionary at that time, uh, who uh, uh, resided in, in Calcutta. Some of you know of him. Um, the, the entire details have been recorded uh, in the book. They had, in fact, been documented by various people. So this is, as I said, this is a known incident, an unfortunate incident in Calcutta's early history, early meaning the 18, this happened in 1831. Um, in November 1831, the incident itself took place middle of the year. In November 1831, K.M. Banerjee publishes this play in which this entire incident is fictionalized, but it's clearly about this incident. And it's about, obviously, the liberals against the orthodox, the bigoted, right? And this is the same thing that you see around you, isn't it, today? What is superstition and how are others who are secular not going to uh, abide by superstitious or, uh, you know, religious rules that have no basis, you question them, you interrogate them. And this conflict, therefore, is at least 200 years old. The play comes out. De Rosio dies the very next month in December 1831. In 1832, 
no doubt because of this incident itself, the following year, K.M. Banerjee converts to Christianity, one of the earliest Bengalis. And by the way, he's a Brahmin, you can tell by his name. Uh, it creates another scandal, conversion to Christianity. Uh, and then, of course, himself tracks a completely different path. He studies at Bishop's College. He, by the way, he's a Sanskrit uh, scholar. He is known for his books on Indology, on uh, Sanskrit studies, and uh, eventually becomes even uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I think it was the president of um, Asiatic Society. He also becomes uh, uh, the uh, secretary of the corporation. KM, uh, Calcutta Municipal Corporation, many other uh, positions he held, but he never writes a play again. That is 1831. The second play by uh, Michael Madhusudan Dutt is his lost play, Vizia. Vizia is, of course, uh, the historical character, Sultana Razia or Rizia, R-I-Z-I-A was the way in which Michael uh, spelt the name. And uh, Michael is about 11 years junior to K.M. Manaji, also a student of Hindu college at that time, also a disciple of that same romantic movement. Michael's father in 1842 decides that uh, he deci uh, his son needs to get married, arranged marriage, as was the uh, uh, the practice during that day. Michael, who has read and knows most of Roman English romantic poetry by heart and is a rebel poet already writing uh, poetry, so he is raised on romanticism. Therefore, he thinks, why on earth should I, mar I uh, go by an arranged marriage? He refuses. And by the way, the girl selected by his father had not even entered her teens. Hmm. Uh, Michael refuses and uh, uh, virtually uh, goes away from home. And eventually, he also, in 1843, uh, converts to Christianity. Because all these uh, young people who are converting to Christianity, mind you, at that time, are doing so because they find in Christianity uh, a democratic impulse, uh, an egalitarian impulse, and also, obviously, it is the, the faith that the Romantic poets, that modern, enlightened Europe is, uh, uh, is mainly following. So that's the reason why this takes place. They are converting because they feel that they have an, uh, a wider horizon that's allowed to them, which the orthodox Hindu society that they belong to does not permit them to do. And then, of course, for various family circumstances, Michael goes off to Madras. He gets employment over there. And while uh, in Madras, he begins, he gets married. He uh, writes The Captive Lady. He writes Rizia in Madras. He prints a few of them, uh, of the scenes in Rizia while he is uh, um, editing a newsletter in Madras itself. And then again, something happens uh, that he doesn't is not prepared for. His father dies. He gets a message that uh, relatives have uh, taken over his property. In 1859, therefore, he uh, rushes back uh, to, um, uh, I'm sorry, not 1859, in 1855, he uh, rushes back to Calcutta and uh, he, he doesn't go back to Madras ever again. He remains in Calcutta. He has a difficult time making a living, uh, but um, he finally becomes quite famous as a Bengali writer. In other words, his first incarn incarnation was as an exclusively English writer, writing poetry and drama, including Rizia, in English. And then when he comes back to Calcutta, he gets a, a, a kind of um, a commission to translate a play for the, uh, the, Raja, the Rajas, uh, senior and junior of Paikpara who had opened their theatre, private theatre, uh, Zamindari theatre uh, in, of, of Bangla theatre in, uh, in the Bangla language um, in uh, Belgatia. And there they were doing a translation of a Sanskrit play. 
Harsha's Ratnavali. They needed a translation of the Bangla translation of Sanskrit into English for their British invited guests. Because obviously the invited guests would not know uh, the, uh, uh, the Bangla that they were watching. So they eventually got hold of Michael, a common friend introduced them to Michael, who also knew of Michael's financial straits um, and uh, therefore got him the commission to translate Ratnavali. And boom, Michael Modushagan's Bangla career began. The Rajas was so impressed by his Bangla uh, and Michael himself was actually quite uh, uh, amazed that he could write apparently so well in Bangla. He promised the Rajas that I can do a better play. And that's what went into his play in Bangla, Shormishta. Again, the Rajas staged Shormishta in 1859 and they um, also following the same principles as before they asked Michael to translate it into English. Suddenly, unknowingly, unwittingly, Michael becomes a bilingual, the first major Indian writer who is bilingually writing the same literary work. First in Bangla, Shormishta, then himself writing it, rewriting it or translating it. We consider it original because it's the writer himself who is translating it into English. That's also published. And then uh, Michael says that uh, basically tells the Rajas who he has come to know, who have become his major patrons by now. Um, uh, you know, I have this wonderful play, which I started in Madras. It's on Rizia, Sultana Rizia. It's much better than Shormishta. Uh, I think you should stage it. I would be only too happy to do it in Bangla for you. And he even gives them a synopsis of the entire play because he's already written more than half of it. It's with him. Silence. No answer from the Rajas. Michael is a little worried what's going on. Um, they are usually very friendly, very warm. So he sends a, a common friend, one of the actors of Velgachia Theatre, um, K.C. Ganguly, Keshav Chandra Ganguly, um, to take his message to the, uh, well, his message is already gone, but to find out from the Rajas what is going on. And eventually, uh, K.C. Ganguly writes, doesn't tell Michael, but writes a letter to Michael which has survived addressing him, my dear Dutt. In those days, you know, you would address each other, even though you were best friends or close friends by your surname, my dear Dutt, etc, etc. The letter is in my book. Uh, the Rajas are not willing to do the play. And it comes down to this. I'm kind of paraphrasing and uh, uh, compressing the information for you. Uh, that is, they do not think that they should be staging anything that has Muslim, Muslim content. Wow. Okay. I will not comment on this, but this is down in paper. Michael is very disappointed. He um, continues to try and persuade them, even when he later on leaves for England to study law, to get a, a lawyer's uh, uh, degree so that he can practice law. Uh, he leaves the manuscript behind so that maybe the Rajas can get convinced. And that is how that particular manuscript came to me, because it was in the custody, the safe possession of the Pathure Ghatta Tagore family, who were very close friends of the Rajas of Paikpara and the direct descendant of the Pathure Gata Tagore family was my student. That's how the manuscript came to me. And it is a fascinating uh, play for other reasons as well, because those of you who might know uh, Bangla theatre's history will realize that in 1873, the first actresses entered 
professional commercial Bangla theatre. Only men used to enact women's female uh, parts before that. And this itself caused another sensation because the actresses came from quote unquote disreputable quarters. This was the Bengal theatre in 1873 with which Michael Modushudan was very closely associated because the Bengal theatre opened with his own play, Chormishta. And Michael wanted women to perform. And it reached such a stage that uh, when the women were selected, and as, as I just told you, they came from this so-called disreputable background, Ishwar Chandra Bidda Shagar, the women's emancipator, who was also part of the committee of Bengal theater, walked out, left the committee because he disagreed. Right? This is 1873. But that is much later. The play itself of Arizia, Michael was never able to stage, tried his best even till the very end. Uh, but nobody was willing to pick up, quote unquote, Muslim subjects. By the way, Rizia, as you all know, why does Michael choose this particular play? Because uh, he creates this character, which is, of course, historical, historically kind of uh, true, accurate. The first woman ruler of the Delhi Sultanate, Sultanate, who was being constantly um, conspired against by her nobles because she was a woman. So there's a kind of, uh, you know, what uh, the, the doubly uh, marginalized uh, cliche is in gender studies now. She is, uh, she belongs to a minority, Islamic minority. She is a woman in a ruling position of Northern India. So obviously a minority on both political and religious uh, grounds. On top of that, she falls in love with her Abyssinian Siddhi slave in the play. Now this may actually have happened, uh, but um, a large part of it has been fictionalized and romanticized by Michael. So again, you have racism here as well, because of the fact that not just racism, but she is in love with someone who is of uh, uh, literally her slave. So from a much lower social stratum and therefore again persecuted on four different grounds for different reasons. So persecution is happening on both these in both these plays. And finally, the third play that comes to us that is in this uh, book is from 1874. And this is a play that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, nobody um, knew of. It was published in Kolkata. It's called Kamini, Kamini, the Virgin Widow. And uh, nobody has commented on it. But it's a very interesting play in which uh, uh, almost 20 years after the Hindu Widows Remarriage Act, in which Vidya Sagar, of course, was uh, was so uh, important. Uh, it was almost a mission for him. It, it's been promulgated in the 1850s, but even into the 1870s, who's listening? Society, I mean, you might enact a law, but society operates by its own laws. So here in this play, Kamini, uh, you have uh, a teenage widow. She's lost, her husband has died. And so she's residing in her parents' house. And uh, she's extremely talented. Her name is Kamini, extremely talented. She is learning piano from a European tutor. She is learning languages, English, etc., from an, another tutor. But her father is Orthodox and will not uh, even 
entertain the prospect of her remarrying, even though she has two very good suitors, one Bengali and the tutor, the European tutor himself. Both of them have obviously fallen for her, but neither of them takes it to the next level. Both of them ultimately make very safe other choices. And so she is left alone and wonderfully uh, ending in terms of the, uh, uh, the conclusion of the play, which I won't tell you right now, but Kamini takes a step which was unthinkable in 1874 at that time. This was also, by the way, five years before Ibsen's classic play, A Doll's House, where Ibsen walks out on her husband. Five years before that, Kamini takes an equally unthinkable step in Calcutta. We'll leave that as dramatic suspense for you later on. The author of this play remains anonymous. I have a feeling that he remains, he or she, could be she, remained anonymous because it might the, the in incident itself actually might have happened because we do know for a fact that there was in fact another sensational case in 1871, the case of Ganesh Shundari Devi Shen. Ganesh Shundari Devi Shen, about whom I've written uh, in the book itself, uh, just like Kamini, ultimately converts to Christianity, another conversion. And this too didn't go down very well in Hindu circles. Uh, it was um, construed that she was pressured to uh, by the missionaries to convert. So whether it was that particular newsworthy incident or it was something else that uh, the author knew about that might have happened which I don't know about because nothing else is spoken about this particular incident. But it's again, this particular play is related to contemporary society. And this is, by the way, in the 1870s. I have done a little bit of detective work trying to track down the, the author. That itself took me, for instance, to uh, the uh, Lower Circular Road, Park Street Cemetery. Uh, but that's another story. It's all in the book. I don't want to take up too much time now. Uh, separated by 20 years, 1831, 1855, 1874, these plays are really very remarkable. And they are all about uh, very serious issues, about religious conflict, liberalism, orthodoxy, bigotry, how a woman, two women in fact, including Razia, two women have to fight patriarchy. These are I'm not claiming that they're brilliant plays, but they are historically extremely important. And by the way, The Persecuted 1831 is the first original modern Indian play in any Indian language. It's a challenge to you. Find an original play in any other Indian language before 1831. And this is being written in English. English and Indian language. Thank you so much. I hope we have lots of questions. I've taken a little bit more time than I should. Sorry about that. Okay, we're ready for questions now. Okay, sir. It's a really, really amazing session. It's a really enriching session for us. So let's move to the question and answer session. And before taking question from the comments, uh, my dear friend Aditya has put two questions in the private chat. Sir, can you read them? Yes, yes. Or I will read it out for you. No, no, no. Uh, this is about Neil Dorpon, right? The first one? Yes, sir. That's the one? Yeah. Um, there is a continuing um, debate, as Adito has uh, rightly pointed out, that uh, Neil Dorpon, which is, of course, a, a historic milestone in uh, Bangla theater, it kind of almost begins the professional commercial, commercial Bangla theater. And, of course, it's a rev revolutionary play. Um, about the indigo uh, plantations run by the British and how they used to oppress uh, the uh, uh, the Bengali uh, peasants of that time under them. 
Um, and uh, this was uh, possibly translated by Michael Madhusudan Dutt. Uh, and uh, we don't know for certain because, as uh, as Adito has actually pointed out, the 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 most uh, important uh, biographer of uh, the most recent biographer, let me put it that way, of uh, Michael Madhusudan Ghulam uh, uh, Morshid, has said that he didn't translate it. Um, I don't think there is uh, positive proof of this either way. What we do know for a fact was that James Long, Reverend James Long, um, very famous Christ Christian missionary, after whom the street in uh, Behala is named, he published it. And therefore, he was the one who was called upon in the trial. Uh, the trial obviously was uh, something that the British institution, because they didn't like the portrayal of the, the depiction of the British uh, plantation uh, owners in this play. Uh, Michael was not named, so um, we really have no clue. It is equally possible that he might have translated parts of it, if not the whole of it, um, and uh, might even have got a commission for it, uh, because this was, remember, 1860, 1861. He was not yet very well known, uh, but this was never uh, something that was completely already. Uh, I mean, it, it, it wasn't something that was written down, so we can't really say for certain on this. The earlier theory was that he himself, he had translated Neil Dorpon, but uh, we don't know. That's that's the only answer that I can give you for that question. Second question. How far the writing of a play like Rizia inspired the elite Muslim society of Kolkata to involve in cultural affairs or uh, events at that time, mostly dominated by upper caste Hindus. Uh, you see, the problem in this situation is that Rizia was on, only a few scenes from Rizia had been printed by Michael Modushudan and that too in his own newsletter in Madras. Okay, so this was no way going to be circulating in Kolkata. There was no print education, uh, uh, print version, edition of Rizia circulating in Calcutta. So there could not have been any influence. Obviously, Michael would have wanted it to be printed, but it never got there because he was so disillusioned, so disheartened by the uh, uh, approach of the Pike Pararajas in uh, not allowing it to be staged in Bangla, that he just kind of left it. He forgot about it. That's that's all there is to it. By the way, the elite Muslim society of Kolkata at that time, Calcutta at that time, was more closely linked with uh, Nawab Wajid Ali Shah. Uh, so that dimension uh, is clearly extremely advanced. We know that there are all kinds of cultural uh, activities in which Wajid Ali Shah's uh, uh, entire, uh, I mean, we have to almost virtually call it a palace and his and the culture that he brought to Mithya Buruj at that time uh, actually in inspired, influenced lots of music, dance and even theatrical circles in the rest of uh, 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 Calcutta. But Michael doesn't have anything. Rizia doesn't have anything to do with that. Okay, sir. So, sir, I have a little question. Sir, as you mentioned earlier in your earlier lecture, like uh, we can classify these dramas as classical Shakespearean tragedy. So, from this time to modern day Othoi, which was inspired by Othello, is there any change in the approach to look at the Shakespearean drama in Kolkata? Oh, yes. Um, if you really want to talk about Shakespearean uh, drama and its influence in Bangla, uh, that's a whole different lecture we have to go into. So, uh, all I can say for today is that in the context of Rizia, uh, Rizia is in five acts. And because Michael had studied Shakespeare, and Michael may even, by the way, K.M. Manaji and Michael, both of them as students of Hindu college, even performed 
recited and performed, even perhaps enacted in Shakespearean uh, scenes, not full plays, but in scenes. These were being done by the students under the various teachers of Hindu college at that time. So there was a performance tradition in English, not in Bangla, in English by the students of the college. Hmm. Uh, now, having been taught and having read Shakespeare in college, you'll understand how much of an inspiration Shakespeare was for Michael. So Michael wrote Rizia following the Shakespearean model, very definitely. But the other two plays are not Shakespearean at all. Okay. Persecuted and Kamini are written in completely colloquial contemporary prose. Okay. Right. They are, they are not in verse. Shakespeare wrote mainly in blank verse. So Michael writes it in, my, in blank verse, perfect blank verse, because he was a master of poetry, hmm? with some prose passages, some prose scenes, just like Shakespeare does with the uh, um, uh, ordinary citizen speaking in prose, the soldier speaking in prose, but the hero spoke, uh, spoke poetry in verse. Hmm? So that's the model that Michael follows in Rizia. But the uh, others, both in Persecuted and in Kamini, are uh, the in both the plays are in complete prose, right through. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So here's a question. Can you see it? Yes, of course. Uh, a PhD scholar in performing arts at the University of London. Uh, your research looks at the ideology of the Brahmo Shamaj and um, you want to know, could you let me know if any drama in English was inspired by the Brahmo Shamaj movement, was performed in Kolkata or different parts of West Bengal. A very precise question um, is that uh, your name is Shatkirti, right? Um, in fact, Kamini uh, is a direct positive answer for the first time out from all these questions. Uh, Satkirti or Shatkirti, um, I don't know if you are Bengali or your Sinha is uh, from Northern India, in which case you'll be Satkirti. Uh, Kamini, directly relatable and connectable to the Brahmo Samaj because it was published from the Indian Mirror Press. And since you are doing research, um, in uh, 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 on uh, the Brahmo Samaj, you will realize that the Indian Mirror, one of the most influential newspapers of that time in the 1870s, was edited by Keshav Chandra Sen. Keshav Chandra Sen was this one of the many, of course, Brahmo Samaj uh, uh, leaders who then broke away and formed his own. Uh, there were various splits among the Brahmo Samaj. This was one of them, KC Sen's breakaway. Uh, faction of the Brahmo Samaj. But by the way, um, Keshav Chandra Sen used to perform in many plays himself. So if you're looking with uh, to a Brahmo connection, there is a tradition of uh, Keshav Chandra Sen himself performing in his own house, uh, being a Brahmo, which is actually sometimes, uh, in fact, it, look, it, it sounds like a contradiction in terms because there is this other uh, very orthodox uh, Brahmo tradition which uh, condemns and disdains the, uh, uh, the theatrical history of Calcutta completely to the extent that you know anyone uh, who is Brahmo should not be associated with theatre at all, should not be watching plays, etc, etc. Uh, so there is that too. Hmm. Uh, but this is a very interesting angle uh, and if you want, by all means, please uh, uh, email me. You can uh, be in correspondence with me if you wish, and I can maybe suggest some other things too. Okay. So here's the next question. Yeah. Yes, Pratyasha, uh, you have the makings of a detective. I can tell that very clearly. Since the author of Kamini remains anonymous, is there any chance it could have been written by someone who was non-Indian? Absolutely. Um, since you have asked this question, uh, 
two names I have already identified as possible authors. You see, what happens is that in 1867, the British, after the first war of Indian independence, um, that took them by complete surprise, as, as you know. Um, they were not prepared for it. They were not ready for it, although some of them had some misgivings. Um, but uh, in 1867, they decided there should be a registration of publications. Publications in all Indian languages. Now, that is, uh, uh, while it was actually meant as a tool of surveillance, right? So that they could, um, the British could make out what might be a uh, possible uh, book to be censored or removed or not allowed to be printed. Hmm? Uh, for us today, it, this, this uh, law has become a huge resource a wealth of information can be gathered from it. For instance, all those little details I was telling you about, about is this called civilization in 1871? Where have I got those details from? From the register maintained by uh, the British, which goes by the common name, Bengal Library Catalog, in which every book that was printed by law, the publishers had to submit copies to the authorities who would then enter them by hand in their register with details of everything, including a comment about what is the content of the book. So the Bengal Library Catalogue for 1874 mentions Kamini. And in the column of author mentions the name Ritchie, G, the alphabet G full stop, Ritchie. Now, everybody who knows anything about Calcutta society at that time will realize that the Ritchie surname is a very famous surname. In fact, uh, there was a British family, uh, a kind of joint family, the Thackeray's, William Thackeray, and the Ritchie's. They were, they intermarried. They were a large family. Many of them were residing in Calcutta at that time. We have a Ritchie Road in South Calcutta. Uh, Thackeray lived in Calcutta. So this G Ritchie becomes the first possible culprit. But I have done a lot of work, research into G Ritchie. Nobody by that name lived in Calcutta at that time that I can find out. OK. Now, the question then arises, why did someone make a pseudonym of G. Ritchie pass off their work under the pseudonym G. Ritchie? Couldn't he have got into trouble subsequently? I can't, I don't have the answers to these questions. Pratyasha, please find out. Do your own uh, research and maybe you can tell me. There's another column in the Bengal Library catalog which lists proprietor of copyright. And under proprietor of copyright for Kamini, there's a different name. J. B. Gomez. G. O. M. E. S. And I have tracked down the Gomez family. Uh, J. Belmont Gomez was actually a journalist in the Indian Daily News at that time and died young. His father lived on. And their tombstones are in the cemetery. I was talking about my visits to the cemetery, not at night. OK, don't go there at night, please. Um, in the daytime, uh, they were very helpful. The authorities, uh, they were very helpful. They uh, took me to the, that particular place. So that is well known. But then why is he the owner of the copyright only? And Richie is the author. Did they jointly write? Richie doesn't exist unless there's a G Richie I don't know of. OK, Gomez is a very uh, common Indian Christian name, Bengali Christian name, as you know. So if they jointly wrote, which is also one of the theories I've put forward in my book, then it, it's as, as much an Indian text as, uh, you know, there, was, there are so many references to very Indian uh, 
events and uh, uh, traits in the play that I consider it, even if it's written by someone who is technically a British uh, native citizen of uh, uh, the United Kingdom at that time, even then I would consider this an Indian play. However, maybe it's jointly written. Maybe it was drafted by somebody who's British. Maybe it was polished up or revised by someone who is Indian. I can't tell. Pratasha, you tell me. The second edition of the book will have your research in it. OK, sir. Here's the next question. Yeah. OK. Um, none of these plays is a translation. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't read that out. Anirman, you want to read out the question so that everybody knows this? OK, OK. Shudyata, Which Shudyata's of these question? plays has been translated by Michael Murshidan Dutt? Michael Murshidan Dutt was uh, converted from Hinduism to Christianity. Was there any reflection of this in any of these plays? Any of his plays? Yeah. OK. Uh, so none of these plays are translated. All these three plays in my book are originally written, composed in English. Okay. Michael translated Shormishtha into English, his Bangla play Shormishtha into English. But that is already available in uh, libraries and in uh, it's been reprinted severally. So I didn't want to do that. Besides, Rizya is earlier than Shormishtha. My hunt was for earlier plays. Okay. Uh, and as for your other question regarding his conversion into Christianity, uh, I think uh, you sh must read Ekeiki Bole Shobhuta because it's a hilarious farce by Michael. As I've been telling you, it's been translated into English by Darokanath Banerjee. I haven't been able to find that book, but the original Bangla you can read. And it actually, and this is very surprising, people don't know this, written in the 1860s, in 1860 actually, uh, it is satirizing the Young Bengal movement. Now, Michael himself belonged to the late Young Bengal movement, but times have changed. And in 1860, he is making fun of the e extremes that the Young Bengals themselves conducted earlier on. So actually, if you read it in Bangla, you will find it's, it's virtually a bilingual play because virtually half of that text is in English. It's about the young Babus who are speaking in English, drinking, getting drunk and speaking wrong English or in, in any case speaking wrong English. So it's greatly funny. It's hilarious. Um, and uh, there is there is clearly this entire thing of uh, uh, Christianity in the backdrop. Hmm. But no, Michael himself does not write autobiographically. OK, all his plays are about, about fictional events, except Rizia is a historical character. But that, too, it has been imaginatively reconstructed by Michael in this play, Rizia. OK, so here's our next question. Yeah. It's your question, Onirban? Oh, this is a different Onirban? No, sir. Yes, I'm Onirban Ghosh. Yeah. Yes, this is Bose. Um, Bengal partitions effect on the culture of theater in Calcutta, the direct psychic influence of separation anxiety in the writings of Neeraj Choudhury. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, you know, this is a question that has actually been uh, uh, raised before. And uh, it's interesting because uh, you would expect that the trauma of the Bengal partition would show up more in Bangla theater than actually it has. So what I'm saying is that uh, Bangla theater after the partition doesn't really deal so much 
with the traumatic events of the partition. For some reason, um, the uh, the maybe the the trauma itself was too searing, was too much, was too horrible to actually depict on stage for a predominantly uh, middle class theatre. We must think of it that way. Though. Uh, you know, opinions are divided about this also because the commercial theatre by that time had come into effect, and there were, uh, although the the uh, audience would obviously have to pay in the commercial theatre, so you would have to think of how many people would be want would be able to pay to enter a, a playhouse in North Calcutta, uh, who would also be belonging to the lower middle class. You understand what I'm trying to get at. In other words, they would perhaps not have the they would not be able to afford to enter a playhouse now think of it this way uh, i'm talking about the professional theater the professional theater depends on box office receipts for its income its revenues right now you put on a play which is about the bengal partition it is going to be very serious you can't make light of an issue like that, right? Hmm. Now, you think about it. When uh, an industry, the theater industry, the professional theater industry, has to bring in the spectators, it has to, therefore, think of the Hindi film industry, it has to entertain. Okay, default option has to be entertainment. In other words, song, dance, comedy, romance. Okay, so the subject, such a traumatic subject as the Bengal partition would probably not be taken up by the professional Bengali theatre. Even if somebody had written such a play, the directors would not have wanted to do it because they would think, you know, who's going to come and see this horrible thing? Right? You've lived through it already. You want to see that again on stage? Yeah. So the the thing over here is that what then happens, why didn't the group theater, right, the amateur groups, the group theater that had begun on the heels of the IPTA movement from the 19, mid 1940s onwards, why didn't they take it up? That's the big question, right? Uh, they were not dependent on uh, on income of you know box office receipts so much, and they ideologically wanted to do serious plays as an alternative, as a break off from uh, you know the uh, the professional commercial theatre. Why didn't they do as many plays as uh, one would have expected? It's not that enough. I mean, there have been plays. But the proportion of such plays on partition in the group theatres is very uh, little. That is a, a bit of a mystery. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Here's the last question of our today's session. Okay. Uh, sir, the Dramatic sir, Performance the Act restricted the plays in many languages. So if the English language performances also fell under this category, fell under this law? Uh, if not, now, did you find yeah. any evidence of theatre teams like they changed their medium overnight from Bengali to English like Amrita Bajar Putrika did in the time of Vernacular Press Act? Yeah. Uh, you see, I mean, I think the the thing that we have to understand over here is that uh, there weren't too many original Indian plays in English before independence. Okay, the English the English theatre in India was mainly, as I was saying, um, Shakespeare. You don't you don't have to censor Shakespeare or comedies light entertainment, musicals done in English. And these were not original. Hmm. They were plays that were either British or from uh, French translated into English. 
So these would not have to be submitted for uh, permission, right? The English theater itself in Calcutta remained more or less uh, aloof from serious concerns. So as a result, for instance, okay. none of these three plays, as far as I know, has been staged in English. Rizia, of course, nobody actually has it in it, had it in, in English until now. But the persecuted had been printed. Nobody staged it until only very recently, just about 10 or 15 years ago in English. OK, and Kamini, of course, also, I, I haven't found any record of it being staged in English. So English theater itself practically didn't exist. So you wouldn't have had to submit these plays because there were no, there were, I mean, there were some original plays. Let us say, for instance, plays by later on Sri Aurobindo or before that Tagore himself. But then Tagore's English plays date from after he becomes famous. And in any case, they didn't have anything you know, to that extent uh, uh, that needed to be uh, clamped down on uh, subversive material, no. Okay. Okay, Does sir, that would you like question? to take a few more questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, okay you like if you have more questions. I have no problem. Okay, okay, sir. So here's the next question. Hmm. Okay, uh, Onuradha, um, what I had said before in answer to the previous question, Onuradha is asking about the reaction of the audience to English plays in the mid 19th century. Sure. Yeah, how successfully did these plays draw an audience and from which society? Um, the English language theater in Calcutta was primarily for the English residents themselves by the English and of the English. OK, uh, very uh, rich, affluent, influential Indians, like, say, the Tagores, others, would also be allowed to enter these, generally speaking, um, uh, white only audiences who were performing. In fact, we do know, for instance, that Girish Chandra Ghosh used to actually frequent English theatre performances in the city. Sometimes, in fact, when visiting companies from London used to come down and perform, Girish Chandra went and saw these performances. Because as a theatre worker, he wanted to know, obviously, you would, how a London company performs. Right. So these would have been exceptional cases. Obviously, most Bengalis would not have known English that well to even want to enter what is primarily uh, the British ruling class uh, Raj audience. Why would you want to go there? Right. So, uh, so that's one aspect of it. And by and large, the English theatre, therefore, depended mainly on entertaining audiences of their own, as I said, uh, performing to their own community, the British community themselves. There was a major uh, revolution, a, a radical step actually, when in 1848, 1848, uh, the apparently the first Bengali gentleman acts beside the British cast members in Shakespeare's Othello. Okay. This has been written about. There are lots of records of it, documents uh, of it. Um, and uh, the, the Bangali gentleman, his name is Boishnob Choron. Uh, well, in, the, um, in English, spelt A-U-D-D-Y. But of course, that means in Bangla, Addo, right? A-U-D-D-Y was the way he spelt his surname, Boishnop Choron Oddi, A-U-D-D-Y. He played Othello. And the, the newspaper reviews that have survived are really very revealing. Uh, 
Um, some, in fact, praised his acting, but most of them were, uh, it was a sensation. And I quote a phrase from one of the new newspapers, a uh, real unpainted nigger Othello on stage. A real unpainted nigger Othello. That was Boishnok Charan. And the audience was so happy that they saw him on stage. Apparently, he was a very good actor, uh, though some critics were, uh, some reviewers were critical of his acting, of his pronunciation. But that became a kind of milestone, a, a turning point. In other words, you have a, a quote unquote native acting alongside the British in a Shakespeare production in 1848. OK, so, so now we are concluding our today's session. Thank you, okay. sir. Thank you for joining with us and enriching us. For we are really, really pleased. Thank you for, really having, pleased. Thank okay. you for having me. Okay. <laughs> OK, before concluding our today's session, I have an announcement for our audiences. Our next session is on 19th June. And we are really lucky to have Ms. Varada Khalatkar. He will, she will be speaking on texts and archaeology, case studies from early medieval Western Deccan. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. Please stay safe. It's not only for you, it's for all of our viewers. Please stay safe. Use masks, yes. maintain social distancing, and yes. get vaccinated. Absolutely, I have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank Bye. you, sir. Please take care. Bye. Good night. You Good night to all. Good night. Good night. <laughs>